I recently saw a video by a historian that was a documentary about the Middle Ages and it was presented as a sort of time traveler's guide to the Middle Ages. I think that's a really fun kind of frame for talking about the subject that's going to capture people's interests, but curiosity got the better of me and I scrolled down to the comments and found that one kind of got stuck in my brain. They basically said that medieval people would assume you're really rich if you went back in modern clothes because our modern clothing is just so much better. They specifically mentioned the fineness of our fabrics, the quality of the stitching, and the cut of clothing. Now I am not a historian. I'm a history enthusiast and I love historical clothing. I enjoy making clothing that's inspired by historical fashions but I really do enjoy reading more deeply about history and the material culture of people who lived in the past. So I couldn't stop thinking about this comment. I want to address the three points that the commenter mentioned and kind of debunk some of the beliefs I think that create this opinion. But in the interest of fairness, I also do want to discuss two ways that I think modern clothing would actually be really impressive to medieval people as well. This video is obviously my opinion because the idea of something being better or worse is inherently opinionated. And I know I'm not going to change the worldview of some people who simply believe newer is better and the older something is, the inherently worse it is. If that's really what you think, you probably won't care what I say in this video. And that's fine. I don't know, go make your own video with supporting texts to prove why you are right. But ultimately, I feel like the original commenter is vastly oversimplifying what material culture was like in the Middle Ages. So drawing on all the reading I've done and my own personal experience making garments, I'm going to give you a kind of differing opinion. And I'm going to have lots of recommended reading and research links down below so you can read a little bit more deeply about the subject too. The hard thing is when you read a lot about a subject, sometimes it can be hard to pinpoint exactly where you got certain information from. So I'm going to try to do some direct referencing where I can, but otherwise I'm just going to give you kind of a group of recommended reading that helped me sort of form a fuller picture of the Middle Ages. So I want to define a few terms going into this video just to clarify exactly what it is I'm talking about. First, when I say medieval, I'm talking about the Middle Ages, which historians kind of agree, more or less, is a time period spanning from about the year 500 to about the year 1500. If that sounds like a very long period of time, um, that's because it is. And things do vary vastly over this course of a thousand years. I'm specifically also talking about Europe in the Middle Ages, and to be honest, most of my sources are based on England and France, just because those are the resources most readily available to me in a language I can read and comprehend. Many people's image of the medieval period is actually more based on the period between the 11th and 14th centuries, what is sometimes known as the High Middle Ages. And this is because there actually were a lot of technological, societal, and political advances at this time. So whether you realize it or not, probably the mental image you have of how medieval people lived, how they dressed, probably comes from this period. And of course, while fashion and technological changes to how clothing was made developed slowly, relatively slowly at this time, they did still happen. So the way people dressed in the 6th century to the 16th century was quite different. And even from the 12th to the 14th century, we do see significant differences in styles. So for this video, I'm mainly going to try and focus on that sort of high Middle Ages era because I think that just is what most people are talking about when they say medieval or Middle Ages. And when I talk about modern clothing, I'm talking about the kind of clothing that is accessible to most people now. Obviously, there are still tailors and seamstresses making beautiful bespoke garments that would be impressive in any era. But the truth is, most of us will never own a piece of clothing like that, or if we do, it's certainly not what we wear in our everyday life. Most people are wearing 
clothing from Target, H&M, Zara, Shein. And that's very different from bespoke tailoring or even small label indie brands. The original commenter didn't say high-end clothing from a Savile Row tailor. They didn't say beautiful vintage items from the thrift store. They said modern clothing. So I think the fairest interpretation of that is the kind of clothing most people are wearing right now in the present day. So jeans, t-shirts, leggings, a summer dress, probably things bought at a fast fashion store or online. The first point mentioned in the comment is about the fineness of fabrics. To be honest, I don't think medieval people would be impressed by modern fabrics so much as confused. From my observation, it seems like most modern people conflate thickness and softness with high quality. And we also really hate wrinkles as a society. The campaign against natural fibers seems to really hinge on the fact that a lot of natural fibers have a breaking in process, so they're not as soft before being worn and washed. And they do tend to sometimes hold texture just from being stored or moving around in them. I do think medieval people would find the fact that our clothes are so mysteriously smooth intriguing, potentially. I would say the average modern person would struggle to identify a synthetic versus natural fiber just by looking at it. Even sometimes by touching it, it can be hard to tell. Our medieval counterparts would definitely be intrigued by how smooth and shiny and wrinkle-free some of our synthetic fibers are, but I think any positive impression would wear off once they see how negatively they perform. Many modern people don't mind wearing synthetic materials because they live and work in a fairly climate-controlled environment most of the time. Combined with that sort of year-round consistent temperature, they probably wear antiperspirants every day and may even take a full hot shower every single day. If you've ever had to go without one or more of those luxuries, um, you'll pretty quickly start to realize how miserable synthetic fibers can make you. In fact, that's why people who go on long-term hiking and camping trips tend to swear by socks that are made uh, with a high percentage of Wool. wool can honestly be worn for days at a time without developing a strong smell or increasing your risk for a fungal infection. Wool can also insulate you even if it gets wet, making it a really valuable fiber for thermal regulation. And unlike synthetic fibers, wool smolders if it catches a spark from a fire, making it safer to wear around an open flame. Petroleum-based materials can melt and get stuck to your skin, causing serious burns in some cases. Medieval people did wash, contrary to the persistent myth that has been debunked so many times, I won't bother, this video is long enough. But it was much more of a hassle, and they spent more time outdoors, or in spaces that couldn't be consistently kept at a temperature we would consider comfortable. They also didn't get to wash all of their clothing after every single wear, as many modern people do. Their clothing really had to do a lot of work to help regulate their temperatures to an extent that we probably don't even think about most of the time. If you spent more than a day or two in the Middle Ages, you would probably want to swap out polyester and acrylic for linen and wool. Linen is amazing for wicking away sweat and other moisture and for helping keep you cool. And wool is breathable, but also insulating. I have been gradually shifting my modern wardrobe over to contain more linen and wool, and I have personally felt a lot of positive effects from this. I know some people absolutely can't stand wool. The modern wool industry isn't perfect in terms of animal welfare, and it can be expensive, so I almost exclusively thrift wool garments. And if even the smoothest merino wool makes you itchy, you might actually have a wool allergy. Um, so if you do want to incorporate more warm natural fibers, I suggest investigating alpaca and cashmere as alternatives. But even in the Middle Ages, you would be in luck because medieval people didn't tend to wear wool against their bare skin, 
A smooth linen underlayer was pretty much the standard undergarment for everyone, regardless of age, gender, or class. The second point the original commenter brought up was the quality of stitching on modern clothing. I think this assumption is based on the belief that machine stitching is inevitably going to be better than hand stitching is capable of being. Rosalie Gilbert points out on her blog, Rosalie's Medieval Women, everything in that era was hand stitched. Girls would start learning to sew at a very young age. Since clothing was an expensive commodity, it had to be well made to last. Since medieval clothing is all organic, most of the clothing that was used hasn't survived. But there are some examples that have survived and have been studied. There are a few examples on Rosalie's blog, um, which I'll link below, and I will also link Heather Rose Jones' site on archaeological sewing. Um, there are some analyses of stitch techniques uh, that have been observed in surviving pieces, and it's really interesting if you're a textile nerd. Many textile pieces that have survived from this era were used ceremonially. There are many religious pieces covered in intricate hand embroidery that show some of the skillfulness of these artisans. In my experience, making hand stitches that are as strong and as neat as machine stitches is not as crazy as it sounds. I've only been sewing for a couple of years, but I have some entirely hand-sewn garments that I regularly wear and wash. The modern method of producing fast fashion, which most of us wear, is about making things as quickly as possible and at a very high volume. The raw edges of the fabric are usually surged over, so kind of thick stitches bind up the cut part of the fabric. Historically, these raw edges would usually be folded in on themselves and then stitched down, creating a smoother, cleaner finish that is much less likely to fray. If you have sensory issues with the feeling of clothing seams, this modern finish is probably to blame. But there are modern techniques that do something similar to the historical folded method, such as French seams. But again, that sort of a high quality finish is really time consuming, so it's reserved pretty much for small label and bespoke clothing. Stitching errors, loose threads, split seams do happen in factory uh, produced clothing, because when you're making so much clothing on such tight deadlines, a lot of small mistakes get passed through. So don't disrespect the quality of hand crafting, especially when it comes to traditional women's work. These women were highly skilled experts. Sewing machines help us save time and avoid carpal tunnel, but hand sewing can accomplish a lot. It can do pretty much anything a machine can. But to be honest, there are certain kinds of stitches that a machine really can't replicate that the human hand can do. The final point from the original comment said that the cut of our clothes would make them stand out as something for the upper class. And they do have a point there. Fabric was extremely costly to produce at this time because industrial agriculture hadn't streamlined the process of growing just one kind of crop on hundreds of acres at a time. Most Europeans were wearing wool and linen at this time, and linen is made from Flax, a plant that most of us probably know better now for its very nutritious seeds rather than its robust and smooth fabric. And of course, wool comes from sheep. The labor to produce the raw ingredients, process it into cloth, and then stitch it into a garment is enormous without modern machinery. So obviously, you wouldn't want to waste expensive cloth. You would use every inch of it you could. So most garments from the Middle Ages utilize a lot of geometric shapes squares, rectangles, triangles. Curved panels would mean more waste. However, by the High Middle Ages, there were some styles that did start utilizing curvier shapes. I made my own linen version of a bliau, a style dated to about the 12th century that cuts in closer to the body and most likely laced shut at the sides. This produced a stylish, tighter fit, and this type of garment was worn by both men and women. And yes, it was really just for the upper class because they could afford to get less out of a bolt of cloth. So modern styles of making, such as garments that use princess seams, darts, and other distinctly modern shaping, would definitely catch a medieval person's interest. But I think the thing that would throw them off about the cut of our clothing, besides things like zippers and elastic that haven't been invented yet, 
is the fact that most of us wear clothes that don't really fit us well. In the Middle Ages, there was no standard size. In fact, that's just something in the last century or so that made being a size 6 or a 10 or a 42 have any meaning. If you were getting a new piece of clothing, it would be made to fit you, either by a professional or a member of your family. Most of the recommendations you get from reenactors or historical tailors for patterning medieval clothing is actually to kind of use a technique of draping it on the body, not using any sort of commercial pattern that is standard size. A modern technique you can also use is to make a body block to your exact torso measurements. Commercial patterns just can't give the custom fit the medieval clothing would have had. So you might reason that since people would hand clothing down, not everything would be made to fit you. And you're absolutely right. Clothing was made to last, so a single garment may have had multiple owners in its lifetime, especially when we are talking about the clothing of the poor, which is why we have so few excellent examples. The clothes were not preserved, but worn to death, possibly being used as rags and diapers once they started to fall apart. But clothing would often be remade. Throughout history, we have seen examples of garments that were altered, adjusted, stylistically changed. So if you had anyone in your family who had some sewing skills and a needle and some thread, then you could alter a garment to fit you better. And when it comes to the cut of clothing, another major way of signaling wealth, besides less efficient fabric use, was actually about the quantity of fabric used because it was so expensive. And here's an area where a lot of modern clothing falls flat. Where's the swish, the drape? <laughs> if you were really rich, you wouldn't be doing manual labor. So really long, full sleeves or skirts that dragged on the ground were ideal ways of showing off all the fine fabric you could afford. And they wouldn't really get in your way while you were doing something, because you weren't doing much. Now, in the interest of fairness, I do want to acknowledge two ways that modern clothing can excel and could be pretty impressive to a medieval person. The first aspect is color. Now, it's a common misconception that medieval people dressed all in gray and black. That's kind of a Hollywood costuming concept, not actually based on any historical evidence. In fact, um, I can recommend The Little Welsh Viking did a video all about black dye. Medieval people loved color, and if you could afford it, you would dye your clothes. Most people could afford some form of plant dye because you could source it from your environment. Different colors were rarer and more costly, so that's why purple became associated with royalty, because it could take multiple rounds of dyeing with a number of different expensive chemicals to achieve the color. Most peasants would be wearing more affordable and easily obtainable dye colors like red, yellow, brown. Up until around the 16th century, black, or at least the shade we consider black, was very hard to make. And in the 16th century, it did become a fashionable court color because over dyeing techniques were developed to create the shade, but it was still an expensive process. So the range of colors we're able to have in our clothes, especially truly dark rich blacks, would be really impressive to most medieval people. Many dyes today are also more stable than some of the plant dyes they would have been using, which could fade over time from washing. That being said, the ecological impact of modern synthetic dyes and how they affect the people who come in contact with them is something that does need to be considered when talking about making fashion less harmful. So synthetic dyes aren't all good by any means, but they would be impressive to a medieval audience. Second is waterproofing. Probably the one thing that synthetic fibers really do have going for them is a greater potential for waterproofing. While tightly woven wool fibers do have some water resistance, meaning that up to a point, water will bead off of it. But over time, especially in a steady drizzle, it will start to absorb water, get heavy, and then take a while to dry. Leather has waterproofing properties, and there are some mentions of leather cloaks, but turning animal skin into usable le leather is a very lengthy process. So most people wouldn't be able to afford a long leather cloak for everyday life. If you want to learn more about sort of the historical leather tanning process, 
I recommend this chapter of Kreft by Alex Langland. As far as I'm aware, the best organic way to create water resistance in a natural fiber is by waxing it. I wax my canvas sneakers to keep them from absorbing water. However, beeswax is a product that your average farm could only hope to produce a limited amount of each year. Maybe enough for a handful of garments to be waxed. So modern raincoats and waterproof boots would probably actually impress medieval people who would have to do outdoor work in all kinds of weather. They would love the convenience of slipping into some Wellingtons. So how would a medieval person react to modern clothing? Well, with all we've unpacked here today, I think ultimately a medieval person would be perplexed, confused by the average modern clothing most people wear today. The cuts and colors of the fabric might hint at wealth, but the quality of the finish would be considered pretty poor by comparison. And living in the medieval world for any amount of time would probably be pretty uncomfortable in medieval clothing, since it's just not as well tuned to thermoregulation as medieval clothing. But leggings, particularly if you're a dude in like Renaissance Italy, that would fit. They really loved tight, stretchy leg wear. We achieve it with spandex and other stretch materials, but they achieved it by cutting fiber on the bias, which would help it stretch and mold to the body. Women in trousers, though, people would be confused for sure. Maybe they would think you were disguising your gender on your journey. Either way, happy time traveling. I hope this was helpful. There are... Hi, Bean. Hello, say hi to the people.